All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Distinguished Kent Lecture. Uh, before I introduce our distinguished speaker, I would like uh, just to give a little background about uh, this Kent Seminar Series. So the Kent Seminar Series and the annual Distinguished Lecture is sponsored by the Paul F. Kent Memorial Fund, which was established in 1977 to support transportation engineering education. The Kent Seminar Series is named after the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign's Department of Civil Engineering, Standout Paul Kent. Uh, Paul Kent. Uh, Paul Kent is a 1920 alumnus of UIUC uh, in civil engineering. He held the highest regard for the civil engineering education he received. He became a civil servant in Illinois as well as in the adjacent states. And he was the founder and president of the University of Illinois Civil Engineering Alumni Association. And I'm not sure if you know, but it is the largest civil engineering alumni association in, in the country. And he was the recipient of the UFI Loyalty Award and the Civil Engineering Distinguished Alumnus Award. And this is make it available, or this funds makes it possible for us to invite the uh, speakers every week, as well as invite our distinguished speaker. We were hoping that our distinguished speaker could be with us today, but I think uh, we take it uh, on Zoom because we'd love to have Steve with us. So let me introduce our distinguished speaker, uh, Stephen Ritchie. Uh, he's a professor at University of California, Irvine, and director of the Institute of Transportation Studies. His research focuses on planning and engineering of intelligent and sustainable transportation systems. His research is motivated by issues of climate change, transportation, greenhouse gases, and pollutant emissions, and the associated equity impacts. He received his bachelor and master's degree from Monash University in Australia and he continued his doctorate uh, at Cornell University. Uh, we're very pleased that he could join us today, and he will be talking to us about data modeling and emerging technologies on the road to sustainable freight transportation. Steve, we're very delighted that you are with here. We have it as hybrid, so we have students uh, who are attending uh, the seminar here in our classroom here, and we have people also in Zoom. So we'll hold all the questions until uh, the end of your talk. So the floor is yours and welcome to UIUC on Zoom. Excellent. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Imad. Let me uh, share my screen. This is going to stop the screen sharing that you have currently, I think. Hopefully you're gonna be able to see my titles. Imad, can you hear me? Yes, we can see you too. Okay, I'm going to try to share the screen. It seems to not want to do that. Yes, yep. now we can see you and we can see the screen. Okay, excellent. excellent. All right, it should be the title slide. <laughs> All right, well, thanks so much and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today, even if we're doing this remotely via Zoom. And it is a great honor for me to um, provide this presentation under the auspices of the Kent Distinguished Lecture. So as Professor Al-Qaidi said, my 
presentation is titled uh, Data Modeling, Merging Technologies on the Road to Sustainable Freight Transportation. And uh, you should be able to see the outline. I hope that's on the screen at the moment. Uh, this is not going to be a heavily technical presentation, though I've provided some technical references to our work in a final slide. It's really more of a selective overview and perspective on past and current freight research that our team has conducted at UCI. I'm going to begin by describing the importance of freight transportation <clears throat> and suggest some issues that I believe have led the public sector in particular to devote fewer resources to freight versus person transportation planning and infrastructure investment. I'm going to touch on some emerging technologies and innovations, especially in the area of digitalization uh, that are now helping to move us forward and provide a, an overview really of some recent projects that have been quite impactful, including the California Truck Activity Monitoring System and a new uh, initiative that we're developing, which we're calling the Freight Mobility Living Lab which is exploring a number of technologies, including LIDAR and uh, automated license plate recognition. Okay, um, you may be interested in who's actually doing most of the work that I'm describing. So I'm pleased to acknowledge in this slide, uh, our current team members, really awesome research team and set of colleagues here. Okay, so the importance of domestic freight transportation and heavy duty trucking in particular in the US is huge in terms of the value of freight moved and the tonnage moved per day. Um, in 2019, 60% uh, was moved by truck and actually within urban areas, it's probably closer to 100% intra urban movement of freight. And like passenger transportation, freight is essential to our economy, our standard of living, quality of life. We saw this at the height of the pandemic with the supply chain disruptions that actually continue today. And in terms of uh, states in the US, California ranks first in the value of imports. And most of those pass through the contiguous ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, which are uh, at least locally called the San Pedro Bay Ports Complex. And that complex is the number one container port in the US and the number 10 in the world. So it's a massive uh, port complex. It's actually just 25 minutes up the interstate from us here at UC Irvine. And so the ports are a major economic driver locally, nationally, and one in nine jobs in surrounding counties are connected to the ports. So with respect to heavy duty trucks, uh, it's important to note that they're relatively small in number, but huge in impact. And um, in California, there's about 275,000 class eight heavy duty tractors like the one that's pictured here, although this happens to be a hydrogen fuel cell tractor. Uh, most of them are diesel and medium heavy duty trucks represent only about 7% of on-road vehicles, but in general, they've got a greatly disproportionate environmental impact uh, for their number. The photograph here, sort of looking southeast, uh, I think is showing the ports of LA, Long Beach, San Pedro Bay ports. The port of LA is sort of in the middle here in the port of Long Beach. It's not so clear, but it's sort of in the background there. Um, Interestingly, the truck share versus rail of moving import containers through the ports has almost doubled recently from several years back, um, almost 60% now. There's a variety of reasons for that. Uh, don't have time to go into, but moving mostly containers, sometimes bulk break, bulk break freight uh, by truck is termed drage, and that's a short distance movement to uh, intermodal terminals, transloading facilities, distribution centers, and so on from the ports, often termed the first mile uh, of freight movement. And in September, there were about 15 and a half thousand drage trucks in service at these ports here. 
when we discuss trucking in particular and drayage also in particular, we need to recognize the role of owner operators in small fleets because small fleets really dominate in the US. Uh, it's almost 90% in the US only have one to six trucks and they comprise about 20% of all trucks. California has roughly 140,000 employed tractor trailer drivers, but 70,000 independent owner operators. And most of them drive heavy duty trucks, class eight trucks, have a median net income of only about $50,000. And the ports rely very heavily on these operators and small fleets. Um, in September, about 70% of the fleets operating the port moving full containers, at least at LA, uh, were small fleets, and they accounted for about 25% of full container moves. That 25% is probably an underestimate because large fleets heavily utilize uh, the owner operators as well. So I think clearly there's a strong interest now in sustainability of our freight system in transportation in general, but in fr freight as well now while we also recognize that we need to improve efficiency and resiliency and the sustainability thrust is especially strong in California. And this involves addressing freight externalities or indirect costs imposed on third parties, such as communities that these vehicles pass through. And so this raises equity and environmental justice issues quite often due to various reasons, particularly criteria pollutants from diesel trucks and trains. Um, NOx, PM, uh, greenhouse gases that are emitted, and the associated, associated air quality, the noise and safety issues. And these issues, um, particularly public health, often disproportionately affect disadvantaged communities. Uh, a controversial and ongoing example is the warehouse boom in the Inland Empire, which is part of the infrastructure associated with the San Pedro Bay ports. It's an area, a very large area, about 50 to 70 miles inland from LA, from the ports. It has about 700 distribution centers. The area of those has doubled in 15 years, continues to grow, handles about 40% of US consumer goods. Amazon's building the largest warehouse in the world there and uh, a very controversial new, new facility called the World Logistics Center, I think has finally cleared all the legal hurdles over a number of years to be built there, uh, some 40 million square feet. And of course, will be serviced by a very large number of heavy duty trucks from the ports and from other facilities And this area has many disadvantaged communities. And um, as I mentioned, a great deal of controversy associated with these developments, although the jobs there are sorely needed. So it's also quite apparent, I think, that in many instances, perhaps until recently with some of the uh, recent leg uh, federal legislation, that there's been quite limited attention and public sector resources devoted to freight versus passenger transportation. Um, one example out of many is that in California, we have 12 public marine ports, including the largest, which is the San Pedro Bay ports, which also is actually losing market share to other US ports, partly because of the environmental constraints uh, its operations face. But California has no meaningful maritime policy. There's no entity that's organizing or advancing um, the freight interests of the state or the various other maritime stakeholders. One area where California does lead, I think, is in environmental policy and sustainability. Um, and a particular case in point, a notable one is the second bullet here, the advanced clean fleets rule, which the California Air Resources Board is now enacting, will require 100% zero emission drage trucks by 2035 and all heavy duty vehicles to be zero emission by 2045. Uh, but in fact, starting in just a bit more than a year, only zero emission trucks may be added to drage service. So any new drage trucks added to drage service will have to be zero emission. And of course, part of the issue is that it's very difficult to actually purchase a zero emission drage truck right now. So, 
what's the problem or maybe more specifically what's the cause of the problem why have fewer public sector resources been devoted to freight over the years why can't we address freight as we continue to for passenger transportation so i'd like to suggest that there's at least three still unresolved and interrelated issues the complexity of freight transportation the lack of policy sensitive models and the lack of data. And clearly these are all interrelated, but I'll touch on each of these. Oops. So with respect to complexity, um, as engineers, we like to collect data. Uh, mostly though, what we observe, especially in terms of truck flows and those associated with international trade like import and export and containers, it's really only part of a larger complex supply chain. We don't usually have one readily identifiable and accessible decision maker that we can go and survey, as we often do with travelers in person transportation, who's choosing modes, destinations, transshipment points, routes, timing, and so on. So uh, is it the beneficial cargo owner, uh, the ultimate owner of the goods? Uh, is it shippers? Is it carriers? Is it the three PLs, four PLs that are the companies providing many of these services to large organizations. And this is compounded by other various and varying influences that I've listed here. In many cases, there is there are very large long-term pre-existing contracts that result in operations. When we go out and collect data, we see an operation that seems suboptimal when we act at the time of observation, but they're a result of existing commitments made in contracts. Uh, things like just-in-time inventory controls, production schedules, shipping costs, and so on. And in, an interesting one is the uh, e-commerce ordering algorithms. Folks in industry have told us that during the pandemic, and I, I didn't know this, but during the pandemic, uh, when lots of folks were at home and going on sites like Amazon, looking at things to purchase, when we hover, when we put our mouse over an item on Amazon and we hover, uh, that often triggers with large organizations, it triggers the ordering of those goods, whether we purchase them or not. And so a consequence of that uh, during the height of the pandemic when so many people were at home was that uh, with folks going online, looking at these things, not even necessarily purchasing them, triggered massive orders of goods that came through the ports of LA and Long Beach and contributed to the congestion. So a question is, is utility maximization, maximization of an individual entity as we utilize in passenger transportation even applicable here? Could we identify utility functions, specify such functions when so much of the supply chain is at best poorly understood and at worst impenetrable to the public sector? not to the private sector, but to the public sector, so much of it is impenetrable. Okay, issue two is related to the first one really uh, in terms of lack of public sector tools. And essentially this is due to a lack of estimable theoretical constructs for development of policy sensitive models. Attempts have been made over the years, a number of attempts to utilize the four step urban transportation planning process concepts. The models resulting have usually been truck trip based models, uh, treating trips as independent, ignoring truck tours, which are quite common in certain instances. Uh, however, recent efforts have included more advanced commodity based models for regional and statewide modeling. An example is a model we developed in California, the statewide freight forecasting model was one of the first in the country. And most recently, agent-based approaches are starting to be explored in freight as well as in passenger transportation. Uh, two examples here, Monique Stinson and Argonne National Lab. I think the link I've provided is to a seminar at ITS Irvine and then Matt Rorta at, at Toronto. Uh, probably, obviously, uh, <laughs> data is a huge issue and uh, rather the lack of it. And there's a persistent lack of publicly available data, even through non-disclosure agreements. The data, freight data are usually privately held and proprietary. There's 
usually an unwillingness to share for those reasons. And I included a recent article that was online in Fortune magazine that sort of exemplifies this. Um, in some cases, you can purchase privately held data, but it tends to be very expensive. And observable, available data are typically only truck counts, uh, not commodities or shipments, but even truck counts uh, by public agencies like Caltrans, and I'm sure other DOTs, are often so limited spatially and temporally and so unreliable and outdated that they're really not useful. And I think Caltrans and CARB would be the first to admit that they have little accurate data, uh, um, an idea of current heavy duty truck utilization of the state highway network. But as engineers to assess the success and impacts of changes that we may be recommending, uh, one really has to be able to measure the system outputs of interest. So we believe and state agencies in California uh, tend to agree that at a minimum, there's a basic need to understand at least commercial vehicle activity and having real-time continuous truck activity data for different truck types and vocations is a basic logical and first step for a variety of the reasons that are listed here. So in this overall quest, uh, an interesting question I think is, can transformational technologies help? And the answer clearly I believe is yes, but I would say not as a panacea. Uh, we know that technological innovation in transportation has fueled the dynamic growth of the US and other countries. We're now well into the 21st century and we're experiencing another revolution in uh, mobility largely perceived to be in the passenger side of transportation, but this revolution uh, I'd suggest is fueled by at least two uh, worldwide forces. One is the decarbonization of transportation through policies uh, and regulations to address climate change largely. And the other is the private sector oriented uh, digitalization of transportation um, through advances in communications and real-time sensing technologies that we've basically all embraced. So uh, I'm just going to fly through these. These are some examples of digitalization, some key trends in uh, digitalization. Time doesn't permit going into these further, but uh, the first is ubiquitous computing because computational devices are all around us. Uh, we have the Internet of Things, which is connected and smart everything, basically, uh, developments in AI and machine learning, the datafication of our world, uh, so-called, and I stress because I'm going to uh, dwell a little more on the second bullet here, advanced sensors that collect data that we couldn't previously collect. And then in the fifth is uh, cybersecurity and digital trust. In terms of applications in supply chain and freight transportation, we're seeing development uh, in a number of areas, um, applying digitalization developments. I mean, zero emission on the decarbonization side, zero emission heavy duty trucks and cargo handling equipment, for example, new refueling infrastructure, and then digitalization, autonomous trucks, robots, drones, uh, deploying, as I mentioned, the sensors and AI and edge and cloud computing. Uh, an interesting new concept that could be valuable for small fleets is truck, the truck as a service concept, which is basically an all-in-one monthly leasing cost for a zero emission heavy duty truck. It's maintenance, but also unlimited charging. So a small fleet, for example, would not have to worry about acquiring charging infrastructure. We are seeing some development of so-called digital logistics corridors. One example is at the port of Long Beach with Amazon Web Services, so-called supply chain information highway. And then, as I mentioned, advanced field sensors and the algorithms that are necessary to go along with them for high granularity data and analytics for public agency planning and engineering. And I'm gonna mention a little more about the uh, Caltrans truck activity monitoring system that we've developed. So heavy duty vehicle attributes though are highly variable. Uh, there are multiple uh, classification systems and they sometimes have different definitions by agency. 
um, the traditional one is sort of FHWA axle configuration, um, gross vehicle weight ratings, and most recently body configurations of tractors and trailers that we've developed. Uh, different fuels, different vocations like drage, uh, long haul, short haul freight, refuse, construction, transit, and so on. Uh, different commodities carried, different age, which usually means or correlates with different engines and emissions, um, different power equipment and energy consumption, large, small fleets and activity patterns, whether they return to base at night for, for example, charging for zero emission and the communities they go through. And this TAM system, I think, is an initial uh, cost-effective step in addressing some of these needs. <coughs> So uh, you can probably tell we're really into trucks. Uh, there's no such thing as a typical truck, really. These photos are meant to demonstrate that. These are all five axle tractor trailer combinations, uh, but they have quite different body types and vocations for the most part. And the TAM system uh, that we've developed, as opposed to focusing on traditional axle class surveys, we, uh, it was developed to try to um, classify tractors and trailers by their body type, as well as provide truck weights from weigh-in motion sites to provide uh, additional insights into things like vocations. Um, and in some cases, the goods carried because you can identify the industries and with containers, you know, they're probably having an origin or a destination at the port. Um, and was also developed actually to help validate the um, California freight forecasting model. So TAMS, as I said, it's a heavy duty vehicle classification and counting system. Um, it's temporally continuous, uh, it's 24 seven. It's spatially representative in California, not in a statistical sense, but covers uh, 90 different locations. Uh, it leverages existing infrastructure, existing inductive loop stations, existing way in motion stations. Uh, it utilizes advanced inductive loop signature technology, and I'll uh, say briefly what that is, as well as way in motion. Uh, identifies an unprecedented number of classes or, or um, types of tractor trailer configurations, 40 or more. And uh, it's publicly accessible. Uh, you can go to this website, actually not using Chrome at the moment. Chrome's giving us some problem, which will be resolved shortly, uh, but publicly available data. So it relies on inductive signature technology, as I mentioned. And uh, the first diagram here is a reflection of what comes off inductive loops uh, by default, which is a binary output. We use advanced uh, uh, detector cards in the cabinet, we can swap them out and they will measure the change in inductance over time and depending on the ferrous mass and distribution in the vehicle. And so we get what's called a signature, which is fortunately largely repeatable and it can be used for a variety of analytics. These again are all five axle semi-trailers. They have the same axle classes, but they have different body types probably can't see it very well, but they do have quite distinct signatures. So signature analysis can, analysis can differentiate these different body types, even for the same axle class. Um, implementation is quite straightforward. It involves swapping uh, detector cards in an existing traffic cabinet, putting in a field processing unit. Uh, we've used some environmentally hardened uh, units that cost, I think, about $800. Uh, we've also tried Raspberry Pis, which only cost a couple hundred dollars and they've worked remarkably well. So there's no need for in-pavement installation, no traffic closures and uh, existing traffic operations are not compromised. This shows the deployment of TAM sites across California, um, about 95 sites, inductive loop sites and way in motion sites at gateways into the state, uh, regional cordons within the state and key metropolitan freight corridors. So uh, TAMS was the first system like this that we had developed and the evolution 
of it and the availability of new sensor technologies as well as user needs have led us to develop what we're calling now the Freight Mobility Living Laboratory or FML2, which really leverages this TAMS research. And so what's a living laboratory? It's really an open innovation ecosystem. And so we're using this to explore the deployment of new approaches for freight data collection. Uh, it provides uh, tractor trailer body types, axle classes. Uh, most recently, we've been able to generate gross vehicle weight rating classes. Uh, it generates truck counts, speeds, even accelerations, uh, truck weights. And we're also using automated license plate recognition and LIDAR. The research thrusts here, well, to further utilize the existing uh, infrastructure the state's invested in, particularly in loops, but really uh, more so to explore emerging sensor technologies and their fusion. So the current deployment status is we've got 126 sites across the state of California uh, that are active. We've actually got 36 today that are active and four of those have LIDAR and uh, 10 of them have license plate recognition. Uh, LIDAR is, uh, you may be familiar with its use in autonomous vehicles. So that's sort of a mobile application. Ours is a stationary one. It's a side fire mounted at the side of the road. These sites span seven counties. They're mostly in Southern California. In the next year, uh, Caltrans District 8, which is really covering that Inland Empire area that I mentioned, is going to deploy about 100 new sites. They've committed a million dollars for deployment of additional sites uh, to serve their operational needs. And they will also serve our research needs. We have new projects with Caltrans and the Air Resources Board to put additional TAM sites out, license plate recognition and LIDAR in the Central Valley in particular, uh, in this region, which has many disadvantaged communities, but many air quality issues. And interestingly, we're going to have a new uh, CARB contract that will expand FML to, to uh, rail freight because we're going to be trying to identify incoming locomotives at uh, state border gateways. As I mentioned, there are the three classification systems in FML2 currently, body type, axle based, and the latest is gross vehicle weight. For, so uh, for a given vehicle, we can describe it in uh, these three different complementary classes. And the gross vehicle weight rating work is really the most recent along with the LIDAR work I'll mention briefly, but we're using a neural network approach basically to um, assign signatures, loop signatures to the gross vehicle weight rating class based on a five-year uh, Look up table essentially of truck models. And even just with that five year uh, listing, we're getting about a 73% correct classification. So we're working to improve uh, and raise that percentage. But this work is going to be reported at TRB um, in another month or so. Uh, you may be wondering why ALPR, why license plate recognition? Well, CARB, the California Air Resources Board, is implementing a $4 billion, that is a B, billion dollar uh, heavy duty inspection and maintenance program next year that will apply to all vehicles, heavy duty or medium and heavy duty operating in the state, both in state and out, out of state uh, to ensure compliance with state emission standards. So they're very serious about this. And automated license plate recognition uses video camera images and optical recognition to determine the license plate number state of registration, and then um, they can determine the age of the vehicle, its probable engine type, and of course that has emissions implications. And we're doing a pilot study investigating the feasibility and performance of these systems. Uh, CARB has floated the idea of, um, if this is successful, maybe deploying 500 to 1,000 ALPR units across the state. Uh, there are privacy issues that are raised with this, whether this would be publicly acceptable, I don't know, but uh, it's certainly a very interesting uh, approach. 
I mentioned we're also using stationary LIDAR. We're really excited about this. Uh, LIDAR is an acronym for light detection and ranging. And basically it's a laser-based system. Scans the field of view, the time it takes for light to return to the receiver determines the distance and creates a so-called point cloud for points on the surface of the object. The advantages of LIDAR are uh, there's minimal environmental influence with LIDAR versus video. The cost currently is quite high. Uh, it's debatable whether it's as high as video, but the potential there is for much lower cost as the units uh, are produced in a solid state format and probably will be much longer lived and more reliable. And there's future, terrific future promise for a variety of traffic sensing applications with LIDAR. Okay, this is um, some photos of one of our installations in FML2 uh, on Interstate 15 near the Nevada border between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. The top right shows a Velodyne LIDAR unit. This is only a 16 beam unit, which is relatively uh, low resolution, 128 is about the highest and we're really using 16 and 32 beams and so not the highest resolution. It shows the ALPR camera, both of these are mounted on the pole here. Uh, the way in motion sensors are in the pavement and then the inductive loops are in the pavement there too. Okay, this is um, a recording, hopefully you'll be able to see this on the projector in the room, but it's a recording from Interstate 10 near the Arizona border showing a video feed in the top left, uh, the live LIDAR uh, stream in the bottom, and then in the table showing, in, at least in the box within the green box, the body classes, real-time body classes um, and uh, axle classes that uh, correspond to the vehicles. So these are the westbound lanes, trucks here are in, in lane two. And so we're getting real time classifications just to demonstrate the system. So there's just one LIDAR unit here and it's primarily um, gathering data from the truck lane here. We are getting data from the other side, but obviously there's, there can be occlusion issues uh, in this case with just one LIDAR unit that's side fire but the primary interest is in this one lane in any event. Okay, we're also uh, working on enhanced vehicle trajectory estimation from the LIDAR point clouds. And the top, exam the top um, image here is a single frame from a LIDAR point cloud. And you may be able to make out the tractor trailer is, is here in the image, but there's lots of background noise. And so background subtraction is attempting to get rid of all the background noise and result in a clearer image of the vehicle, which is shown in the lower single frame of the point cloud. Then we try to reconstruct the image by taking multiple uh, frames of the acquired point clouds for each truck and combine them to get a denser point cloud representation. So these are single frames when combined can get a much uh, denser representation of the vehicle. And this is an example for um, a tractor with a single tank trailer. Here's a couple of the uh, individual frames. This is a top view as much as one can get from a more or less side view, uh, side fire lighter, but it results in this image, which is much denser and much clearer. So um, we're trying to develop accurate trajectories and answer this particular question. Can tracking the same points in the reconstructed point cloud provide more accurate trajectories? We think the answer is yes. The difficulty is in, in proving it. Um, but this has some major implications because if this can be done, and we believe it can be, that we can develop just from a LIDAR unit, especially when we get to solid state in expensive units, accurate traffic state parameters, simulating inductive loops without having to install loops within the traveled way. So things like volume, speed, even acceleration, uh, occupancy, 
with uh, applications not just for traffic operations, but for example, potentially detecting impaired driving and with license plate recognition systems, local emissions estimation. This is another animation. Hopefully you can see it on the projector where on the left side, we have the raw LIDAR scans and so not very distinct, not very detailed. And on the right, we have the reconstructed point clouds after reconstruction and also um, trajectory estimation. And hopefully the um, improvement there is apparent, particularly when we get a tractor trailer going by. Some of our ongoing research, which um, uh, my, some of my PhD students are working on, are uh, improved trajectory estimation, along with the applications, truck fleet characterization, and especially multi-sensor fusion, um, so-called spatio-temporal re-identification, which means re-identifying uh, trucks at the same site at different times but also tracking them across different sites um, at different locations. And we've actually already demonstrated using inductive loop ID <coughs> up to 30 miles, and we hope to be able to uh, exceed that limit and go beyond 30 miles. So um, I think I've packed a lot into this and I see we're at time. So let me just summarize um, the at limited attention and public sector resources devoted to freight versus passenger uh, transportation planning and an infrastructure investment. Fortunately, for those interested in freight is giving way to wider recognition of the importance of international and US supply chains, and in particular, the associated domestic freight transportation issues. Uh, transformational technologies, and I think digitalization in particular, are part of the solution, but really there are institutional barriers that still have to be overcome and particularly with respect to data. There are moves in that direction and some of them are associated with the ports. Uh, we do see this in terms of development of so-called freight villages in air freight in other countries. Uh, they tend to be associated with particular carriers and particular routes but uh, it is beginning to happen. And I think the recognition even within the private sector that this is important uh, is it is starting to be recognized. So uh, FML2, our freight mobility living lab, we believe is cost effective and it's a scalable system. It's valuable, not just to researchers, but to practicing engineers and planners and policy makers. We're continuing to work on FML2. And for those of you who may be graduate students in the audience that are looking for research topics, uh, theses and dissertations, uh, there are really many exciting, impactful research challenges in this area. And I mentioned our Freedom National UTC proposal that Professor al Qaeda has led. Um, I think this is the title page. Hopefully, and we're optimistic that this will be funded. Uh, lots of exciting opportunities if it is to participate in this and hopefully we'll get a positive decision within the next couple of months. And uh, my last slide has some of those references that I mentioned uh, if you're interested in following up there. So thanks so much for your attention and um, that really ends my presentation. Thank you so much, Professor Ritchie. That was uh, a very exciting uh, speech and uh, definitely have several questions here. I do have some, so I'm going to start with you guys. Javier? Professor Ritchie, I was wondering if you could elaborate on why dryage is in increasing and maybe tell us more about why we're not using rail as much. Like, what is driving that? Can you elaborate a little more? Yeah, Javier, this is a great question. Um, my understanding, and this, uh, you may have colleagues in the audience that know far more detail about this than I do, but I believe part of the reason, a big part of the reason, is the inland yards um, that Union Pacific and BNSF that serve the ports have become so congested with 
containers and for other reasons that they cannot run the same, I mean, it serves no purpose to bring more out of the ports to those locations. And so for uh, that reason, among others, I believe, has caused them to reduce the number of trains that um, are serving the port, and in particular, the on-dock rail where they move containers from the ships direct to rail. And as a consequence, there's been a lot more truck movement. Uh, I was in a discussion with uh, one of the LA port executives yesterday or the day before, and he said that that is starting to reverse, um, which is probably a, a, a good thing. And, and the reality is that in terms of the ports of LA and Long Beach, um, you may know that there's there are two major freeways that serve the ports, and one in particular is Interstate 710. Uh, there's been a study going on for decades, actually, about potential expansion of the 710 freeway because of the number of heavy duty trucks. That study was just abandoned earlier this year after tens of millions of dollars were spent on it. And so the way forward really seems to be that for the growth and um, really sustainability of the ports that are, we're going to have to utilize rail to a much greater extent. There's a project um, or a corridor called the Alameda Corridor. Uh, it's a rail facility, a depressed rail facility that runs from the ports to really the rail yards around LA and, and beyond. Has a capacity of about 150 trains a day, I believe. Uh, until recently, it was running about 50 a day. And I think uh, very recently with the decline in rail at the ports is down to the high 20s. I think we're we're really going to have to find ways to um, increase uh, the rail service to the ports. The capacity, at least in the Alameda corridor, is there, but there are proposals for expansion, uh, creation of inland ports for moving containers from the ports by rail to inland lo locations as well. So there are a number of strategies we can pursue, I think, but um, moving containers by truck and diesel in particular is really not a sustainable approach going forward. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Yes, Anjali. Hi, Professor Ritchie. This is Anjali. Um, I'm just curious, you're creating a lot of data and if transportation agencies were going to implement this, what is the thought in how they should handle large data sets like this? And also you mentioned this can be scaled up. What, what are some challenges in scaling this up when networks are actually communicating? Interesting question. Um, at this point, we're mostly using edge processing. So the, the, um, with respect to the LIDAR, the point clouds are being analyzed locally. And so the features and attributes of the images are being sent to our servers at UCI and ITS at this point. When District 8 uh, deploys their 100 new locations in the Inland Empire. It's, I think the plan is that they will probably still have the data sent to our servers uh, and then transmitted to uh, District 8 as, as they need the data. We haven't really reached a point yet um, where we've had significant problems. Um, particularly as we're doing more local edge processing. We used to send everything in terms of like the loop signatures, everything to ITS, but where that, that was creating problems with some of the Wi-Fi connections that in some locations are not very strong. So uh, I guess all I can say is we haven't really had a problem thus far. I don't think we will in the next year, but there is a potential, as you've pointed out, for this to occur uh, if the system really is expanded, say, to a thousand locations or more uh, statewide. And we'll have to address that as it arises. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Professor, for the nice presentation. Um, I was wondering about the database, the, the TAMS database, that we're classifying the trucks in a different way based on their signature body shapes. Um, maybe I missed it, but what's really the importance or, of considering the body shape instead of a conventional classification? Well, the conventional classification system is basically axle classes, but you know some of the slides I, I showed uh, 
show that you can have many trucks that have the same basic um, FHWA axle class, but they have very different body configurations, right? Truck, truck bodies that could have a re refrigeration unit, could have a sleeper cab on the tractor. The ones that have sleeper cabs are usually long distance. The ones that don't are usually more local. Um, and then the trailers have a variety of different configurations. So um, sometimes you can associate uh, the body type with the industry. And if you can tell it's a 20 foot or a 40 foot container or a 53 foot domestic uh, container, uh, that can provide useful information. State agencies find it useful. Um, and sometimes you can associate it with industry too. So if you can determine that it's a dump truck, it's usually um, an older vehicle, a dirtier, more polluting vehicle, and they tend to be concentrated in urban areas. So it all, the, the connection is perhaps indirect, um, it's suggestive, and uh, nevertheless, state agencies are finding it useful, particularly the Air Resources Board. Um, and ultimately it all is, still connected to sustainability and emissions in particular. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have one last question. Did you change your mic? Uh, thank you for the presentation, Professor Ritchie. I had a question about the LIDAR sensor. So you showed in one of your slides that first the image is kind of blurry, but then you achieve dense reconstruction by combining several frames. But even after you combine several frames, the resulting image is sort of ambiguous and i was wondering like what the next step after that dense reconstruction is to determine exactly the geometry or the specifications of the structure like is there a neural network running behind the scene to determine yeah. more specific information or do you need the uh, like human intervention after that like what's the current plan yeah there is the there's machine learning uh going on behind the scenes and various neural networks we've got if you look at, uh, if you get access to um, the last slide uh, that I showed that had some of the references, I believe we've got at least one, if not two papers there. We're, we're working on um, characterizing the LIDAR point clouds for classification purposes as well, uh, so that independent of the loops. So we're looking to do that. And you're, you're right that those images are still kind of fuzzy and not terribly well defined. And Part of the reason is, uh, as I mentioned at one point, that the LiDAR, <laughs> the LiDAR units we're using are uh, still relatively low resolution. There's 16 beam, 32 beam. Uh, we'd like to use the 128 beam units, but they're currently extremely expensive and Validine hasn't volunteered to donate those to us or to sell at a very low cost. Uh, they've been very generous with um, so far with collaborations with their other units. But I think as we move to solid state, the costs come down and we can achieve the higher resolution images, then the classification work that we're doing with machine learning will uh, hopefully provide even better results. But you're right, the images are a little fuzzy, but it's remarkable though what one can do even with those images. Uh, in extracting the appropriate attributes and using them in a neural networks type approach. All right, if there's any one last question, if not, I do have a quick question actually during the presentation came to my mind is, uh, why using like, instead of LiDAR, we can use uh, thermal images, that's gonna be maybe cheaper and that will allow us maybe to characterize this. Have you ever thought about this or, uh, the answer is no, uh, we haven't thought about that. It's, um, I know the video imaging is using infrared as well. And, um, yeah. you know, uh, because of the problems that video has, uh, uh, at nighttime and with, you know, inclement weather sort of thing, we haven't thought of that. It's an interesting possibility, um, I'd be kind of intrigued to see if that could also add to uh, performance when we do our data and sensor fusion. Right. So.